I'm dealing with this series on the assurance of eternal life, both true and false. And I've actually transferred my dealing with that to these Wednesday evening studies. Last time we were observing the sufficiency of the Holy Scripture through which we can gain assurance, solid sound assurance that we are children of God and, pos and in possession of eternal life. In the outline overall, I'm dealing with a section in which I have pointed out that John, the apostle, who wrote the first epistle of John, in which he said his purpose was that we might know that we have eternal life, does not list spiritual gifts, miracles, visions, dreams, hearing extra biblical voices, either without or within, out-of-body experiences, and such like, as proof that we are children of God. And so we are really shut up for our most solid and substantial evidence to the scriptures and comparing ourselves and our beliefs and attitudes and practices with the holy scriptures. And by this means, we are identified as the children of God. And we've been going through that rather thoroughly with you. And what I'm doing now is kind of segueing off of that just to show you that we have in the Bible a perfect, complete, and all-sufficient revelation of God given to us, whereby we may know that we are the children of the living God. And what I want to do tonight is something I've done before, but I want to go back and cover this ground again to show you the completion of the divine revelation that has been made to us with the completion of the New Testament in the book of Revelation by the Apostle John, or through the Apostle John, and that we have a complete and perfect revelation given us from God. We need seek no other word from God or revelation from God in order to know we are his children and in order to know his will for our lives. So I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 7 down through the conclusion. And what I want you to do tonight during this study as I want you to keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 13, because we're going to continue to come back to that. And I'm going to try to analyze this with you very carefully. There is a very powerful, powerful argument here that we can make to um, show the error in the modern day charismatic movement, where they are claiming to perform miracles and speak in tongues and have prophecies and visions and revelations. It is not uncommon in modern day professing Christianity to hear people saying, the Lord said this to me and the Lord spoke to my heart and on and on and on, claiming these extra communications from God in addition to Holy Scripture. And we're going to see that Paul makes a very, very terse, concise, but powerful argument to show that all such methods of divine revelation have ended with the perfection and completion of the Holy Scriptures in the New Testament. Now, again, this is a very concise argument. You're going to have to follow me. If your mind wanders or something like that, you'll miss it. You've got to follow the logic of this. It's a tremendous, powerful passage just to sound the death knell to this modern charismatic movement. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Beareth all things. Let's talk about charity, what charity does. Charity beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, the first thing I want to do is focus in on verse 8, where Paul says, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Let's first of all analyze clearly what it's not saying. Paul is not saying when he says prophecy shall fail, that that means that any prophecy God has given us is not going to come to pass. That will never be the case. Neither is he saying when he says tongues shall cease, that that means there's a day coming when there won't be language anymore, 
or when he says knowledge shall van vanish away, that that means there's a day when we're all just going to wander around in hopeless ignorance. What he's talking about here are the gifts of prophecy and of tongues and of, and of knowledge, special gifts that were given to the early church. You can see this by just backing back a chapter and going to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and beginning at verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So Paul here in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 13 is dealing with the gift of prophecy. When it comes to the gift of prophecies, they shall fail. When it comes to the gift of tongues, they shall cease. When it comes to the gift of knowledge, it shall vanish away. You see, in the beginning of the New Testament era, they did not have the complete New Testament like we have it now. When you went to an assembly in the early days of the New Testament, you didn't have the pastor getting up and saying, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 or Romans 15 or quoting one of those passages that were written. You didn't have that. The divine revelation was in process of being delivered and in process of being written. And so during this period of time, when the New Testament did not have the completed New Testament, God gave these gifts like the word of wisdom, which would impart to God's people the ability to make right application of their knowledge and the decision-making uh, processes of life, uh, or the word of knowledge, where there would be a particular piece of information imparted, or the gift of prophecy, which is, as we have pointed out, the gift of divine revelation, maybe expounding on some uh, effect of the redemptive work of Christ, or speaking of some future event, or some something like that. I don't particularly understand where the fine line of difference would be between the word of knowledge and the gift of prophecy, and as much as all of these are gifts that would involve a, a communication of divine revelation. Uh, we have not lived in the time when those gifts were in exercise, so I can't really expound to you uh, a fine difference there. I'm just kind of taking an aim at it. Uh, but nor do we really need to understand the fine differences there because we have the completed body of wisdom and knowledge and prophecy in our 66 books of the Bible so that those gifts are no longer in effect. But just to repeat again, in the beginning of the New Testament era, the early church did not have the completed written New Testament. The gifts of the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and prophecy served to provide revelation of the New Testament during that time. And as this divine revelation was being given, it was being confirmed by gifts like miracles and tongues. Those were signs that confirmed the revelation of God as it was being given. I'm going to be focusing tonight on the gifts of divine revelation, such as the word of knowledge and the word of prophecy, because that's what Paul zeroes in on in the passage that we are considering tonight. So, the, but now with the completion of the New Testament, those revelatory and sign gifts confirming the revelation have served, served their purpose and therefore are no longer in effect. So now this is extremely important, what I'm going to bring forward. This is a very powerful argument. If you're ever witnessing to a charismatic, if you can get them to calm down enough and listen to a logical train of reasoning, this is a very, very powerful argument to show the error in their thinking. In this passage, Paul mentions four things that were currently taking place in the church at the time he was writing 1 Corinthians 13. Four things. And these four things were faith, hope, prophecy, and knowledge. He mentions prophecy and knowledge in verse 8. He mentions faith and hope in verse 13. Now notice in this passage, you have the nouns that name these activities faith, hope, prophecy, knowledge, and you also have the verbs that are setting forth these respective activities. For example, faith, we read in verse 7, believeth all things. Hope, in verse 13, we read in verse 7, hopeth all things. And then prophecies, in verse 9, we read, we prophesy. And then knowledge, we read in verse 9, we know. 
And so these four activities are presented to us in this passage in both the noun form and in the verb form. And I want you to notice that when we read those verb forms of those four activities, faith, hope, prophecy, and knowledge, that these activities were being set forth in the present tense because all of these things were functioning at the time Paul was writing. There were prophecies being given. There was the word of knowledge being imparted. People were believing and people were hoping. Now, there's one thing here that I want to point out, and that is Paul says, charity never faileth. Now, he's going to point out that prophecies and tongues and, and knowledge are all going to fail. Those gifts are going to pass away. They're going to terminate. And uh, we're also going to see that faith and hope have a point where they terminate. But one of these things mentioned in this passage that will never terminate is charity. Charity never faileth. That will go on and on and on throughout all eternity. It will last through time till we see the Lord face to face, and then it will go on and on. If you want to get an idea of what heaven is like, all you have to do is go back and start at verse 4 and read down to verse 6, and you will get an idea. You will have a description of charity. And remembering that charity never faileth, we're going to find out, we see here that when we get to heaven, we're going to be in a place where there's no envy. No one is ever puffed up with anger. No one is ever puffed up with pride. No one ever behaves himself unseemly. Everybody rejoices in the truth. There will be no rejoicing in iniquity and um, be a great place to be. Everybody will be kind. However, there's one aspect of charity that we won't have to, we won't encounter in heaven. And that is where it says charity suffereth long because when we get there, we'll not be suffering anymore. But you get an idea here. Charity never faileth. All right. Now, all these four things in this passage that I've mentioned, faith, hope, knowledge, and prophecy, all have a point at which they end. And we know that from verse 8, where Paul says, prophecies, they shall fail. And where he says, knowledge, it shall vanish away. So, and he uses the future tense, shall fail, shall vanish away, because these gifts were still in effect at the time Paul was writing. They hadn't ceased yet. But he's letting us know that somewhere out there, those gifts were going to terminate. But then the same can be said with regard to faith and hope. Now, in this passage, when I'm talking about faith, I'm talking about faith as that principle that operates without sight. Now, to be sure, in the Bible, you read of people seeing things and believing. Like, for example, when the children of Israel saw the great work that God had done on the Egyptians, it is said in Exodus, the end of chapter 14, that they believed. That was in the last verse. And then if you go over to John chapter 11, when the people saw what Jesus did in raising Lazarus from the dead, many of the Jews, when they saw that, they believed. So there is a seeing and believing. But faith, as we're looking at it right now, is this principle that is operative whereby we believe what we don't see. For example, Paul says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, watch it now, the evidence of things not seen. Then come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And remember, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 13, because that's the passage we're going to continually be coming back to as we reason through the verses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Watch it now. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Observe how faith here is put in contrast to sight. This is that principle that operates whereby we believe what we don't see. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Then we come over to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, which I referenced the other Sunday. 1 Peter 1, 8. Whom having not seen, speaking of the Lord Jesus, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So here's that principle of faith that enables us to believe what we do not see. But that will terminate. When at last we see the Lord face to face, we will no longer be believing in him whom we have not seen, for then we will see him. Faith as a principle operating without sight will terminate at that point, for then we shall see what now we do not see, but believe. 
And we know that this faith in this respect has a point where it terminates or finishes because we read in Hebrews 12, 2, that we are looking unto Jesus, the author and, watch it now, finisher of our faith. So somewhere out there, faith, as that principle that credits the unseen, will be finished because we will finally see what now we believe in without seeing. Now we come to hope, and it's the same thing. I want you to think of faith and hope like this. Faith is believing what we don't see, and hope is expecting what we don't see. And there's a point where hope is going to terminate because what we're expecting, we will finally see. And when we see it, we won't need to hope for it anymore. And this is made expressly plain in Romans chapter 8. So go over to Romans now, chapter 8, where Paul is talking about the future redemption or resurrection and glorification of our human body, which is now in a state of vileness and corruption and breaking down and groaning and travail and pain. And Paul says in Romans 8, 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. This is when our body will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, will be fully conformed to the glorious body of Jesus Christ, and never know the travail, the pain, and the groans, and the aches that it is subject to in its fallen condition in this world. And so then he goes on and says, speaking as he's, as he's talking about this wonderful expectation that we have out in front of us, he says in verse 24, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So once we see the glorified body, once we have it, once we see the Lord, well, we won't be hoping for that anymore because there's no need to hope for that which we see. So faith is that thing that enables us to believe what we don't see. Hope is that thing that enables us to expect what we don't see. And so as it comes to, as these things respect the unseen, faith will end when we see the Lord in glory, Hope will end when we see the Lord in glory. So we know the termination point of both faith and hope will be the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when at last we see what we have believed and expect and have and receive what we have expected. Every, I, ho I hope everybody sees that clearly. I, this is the disadvantage of communicating with you by this means is I can't see your faces and see yeah. your heads nodding. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. Because if you don't get that, you're going to miss the line of reasoning that Paul is laying, laying out for us in this passage. Nope, very All right, clear. Yeah. I'll just point very clear so far, Pastor. Okay, Fred. thank you. Thank you, Fred. Glad it's clear to you. All right, now, so we see that all of these four things have a point at which they end. Now what we need, we know when faith is going to end and hope it's going to end. That's going to be at the redemption of the body, at the second coming, when we see him by and by. But now what about this thing of the word of knowledge and the, and the prophecies? Where are they going to terminate? Because Paul is making it very plain in that verse 8 that somewhere out there, they're going to fail, cease, and vanish away. Now, he goes on in verse 9, and, 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 and notice what he says. Four, four. Now, verse 9 begins with that word four because it's connecting back to what he just said in verse 8. He's going to draw a conclusion from what he said in verse 8. So he's just told us in verse 8 that prophecies shall fail and knowledge shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, that word for, again, is linking back to verse 8 which listed the gifts of prophecies, tongues, and knowledge. Therefore, that expression, we know in part, we prophesy in part, is referring to the exercise of these gifts and the fact that only partial revelation was communicated by them. For example, no one prophet in the New Testament conveyed the complete revelation. Um, even the Apostle Paul, 
uh, only wrote part of the New Testament. He didn't write it all. The entirety of the divine revelation was not communicated through Paul's gift of prophecy. So every prophet in the New Testament that had that gift only exercised it in part. There was only some of the revelation given through that person with that gift, or there was only some knowledge that was given through the person that had the gift of the word of knowledge. And even in this particular case, as Paul was writing this very passage in 1 Corinthians, he was prophesying in part because you see, he had more scripture and more epistles that he would yet write. So again, this was only partial revelation, partial knowledge that was being given through the exercise of the gift. So uh, as those gifts were being in exercise, as you had the gift of prophecy being exercised at that time, and as you had the gift of knowledge being exercised at that time, Paul could say, for we know in part, we're only giving partial knowledge through the exercise of the gift. And we prophesy in part, we're only communicating part of the revelation by means of that gift. But by contrast, when that which is perfect, and the contrast here is between what is partial and what is perfect. When that which is perfect has come, when we have perfect knowledge, when we have perfect uh, prophecy, then that which is in part, which was the gift of prophecy and the gift of knowledge, shall be done away. So when you look very carefully at the line of Paul's reasoning from verse 8 down to verse 10, that which is perfect is referring to a perfect body of prophecy, a perfect body of, no of knowledge. Paul is teaching that the gifts conveying revelation, such as the word of knowledge and prophecy, would be done away when the revelation, the body of knowledge and prophecy, would be complete. You see, in this passage, we are not dealing with the perfection of persons. We are rather dealing with the perfection of information. Let me say that again. In this particular passage, verses 8 through 10, we are not dealing with the perfection of persons. We are dealing with the perfection of information. I'm going to say it a third time, just in case somebody missed it. In verses 8 through 10, we are not dealing here with the perfection of persons. We are dealing here with the perfection of information. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Therefore, since we now have the completed divine revelation given lastly through the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, chosen by him to be the vehicles through which his revelation would be complete, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. We believe through their word. John writes the book of Revelation, signs it off, saying you don't add to this, you don't take away from this book of prophecy. And that becomes the 66th book of the Bible, thus completing the divine revelation that is given from the first book to the last book, the entirety of the divine revelation in the 66 books of our Bible, which we saw paralleled in the prophecy of Isaiah, which confirms that this is the complete, all-sufficient body of revelation given to men. God hath spoken, there is no more that we look to hear from God until we see him in glory. He has Amen. given us all the information we need right now in these 66 books. So we do not, therefore, since with the completion of the information in the 66 books, we do not still have the gift of prophecy and knowledge in operation since the divine revelation is complete. Hence, we look for no more dreams, voices or visions to convince to convey these things which were the means whereby God did convey these revelations in the prophets like we read in the book of numbers if there be a prophet God said I will speak to him in a vision or in a dream we don't look for that anymore because we have the completion in the written revelation of God it is interesting to notice that as the revelation was being given through the apostles they were busy writing this stuff down. Either apostles were doing it or those who were under the direct influence of apostles, and therefore their books were apostolically influenced 
They represent the apostolic doctrine. They were in the process of writing it down. And it's interesting. I'm just going to run through a string of passages to show you the process of the revelation given through the apostles being committed to writing. Just a few verses to make this point. Okay, now keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 13 because I'm not done with that yet. We come over, for example, to Luke chapter 1, where Luke says in verse 3, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, to write from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Then we come over to John chapter 20, John chapter 20 and verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Romans chapter 16, the epistle of Paul to the Romans, verse 22. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, See, Paul was the author. He dictated it, but Tertius was the stenographer. He wrote it down. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. And by the way, an epistle is a written letter. Go look up the definition. It's a written document. And then um, we can go over, for example, to Galatians. I'm just going to give you a sampling. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse uh, 11, ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Um, then we could go over to uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Or we could go over here to um, 2 Peter chapter, chapter 3 and verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. 1 John 1, 4. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Jude chapter 1, verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And lastly, Revelation 1 and verse 19, where Jesus Christ says to John, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. I think I've made a fair case that as the revelation was being delivered in the days of the New Testament, through the ministry of the apostles, they were busy taking that revelation and committing it to writing. Until you get to the last epistle, and revelation, by the way, is an epistle because it was addressed to the seven churches of Asia. When you get to that last written document, then it seals off with don't add to, don't take away. The revelation is complete. God hath spoken. God hath spoken, not continuing to speak, but hath spoken in these last days by his son who committed that revelation to his apostles who committed it to writing. It becomes inscripturated in our New Testament. And thus the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 is fulfilled that when the 490 days, or 400, uh, or the 70 weeks, 400, the 70 weeks, 490 years, uh, were determined upon Daniel's people in that period of time the vision and the prophecy would be sealed up. It would be finished. It would be done. And within that period of time is when our blessed Lord selected his apostles through whom he would convey the final sealed up revelation that would be contained in their writings. And that's why I was pointing out to you last week this um, article of faith on the Holy Scriptures in the Philadelphia Confession, which I, which I quite agree with, though there's things in there I don't, but this one I do. Um, they talked about the revelation of God being committed wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly to writing, which maketh the Holy Scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God revealing his will unto his people being now ceased.
So there you have it. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13. We've got that which is perfect is come. The perfect body of prophecy and knowledge, the perfect body of information in our completed New Testament. And this can be pointed out from other angles, uh, which I won't go into because that would take me too far afield. But you do have the Lord telling the apostles in the upper room discourse that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. And he did. This is all the truth we need to get us through this world until we get to glory. That's all we need. It was committed to them. They committed it to writing. And we're so blessed to live now today beyond the gifts of prophecy and knowledge where partial revelation was being conveyed piecemeal in the early New Testament days. We've got the whole shooting match that we can hold in our hand, read and study how blessed we are to live in the day when those gifts have ceased <coughs> because that which is perfect is come. Now, Back to 1 Corinthians 13, and let's go to verse, chat, verse 11. And we're going to notice that Paul is going to shift his train of thought. And notice that verse 11 does not begin with a connective word like for, or therefore, or wherefore, or seeing then, no, or then. He, he does not begin with those type of words that would take the thought in verse 11 and build off of the verse that went before it. it. That's not what we have. We have him shifting to something else now. When he says, when I, now notice he's speaking as a person. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now it's obvious in this verse, he's talking about personal growth. When he was a child and when he became a man how he processed things when he was a child and how he will process things when he's a man. He's talking about personal growth from childhood to adulthood. For now, for, now he's gonna take his next point and draw off of what he just said, which was dealing with the subject of personal growth. He said, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Again, verse 11 does not begin with a connective word, linking it to the foregoing verse. See, what I'm doing, brethren, is I'm showing you the train of reasoning. Like I'm saying, it's a very terse, concise chain of reasoning. You got to stay with me. Or like L.R. Shelton used to say, I'm apt to jump, a creek, jump, uh, uh, jump over a creek and you're going to fall in and get drowned. <laughs> it was a preacher out of New Orleans, Louisiana, I used to listen to many, many years ago. I, it, <laughs> I'm reaching that point where now I can start speaking of many, many years ago, speaking in the context of my own life. But anyway, for now, so anyway, verse 11 does not start with one of those connective words. So what Paul is doing is introducing a different subject. Paul is now dealing with the growth of a person, and he is using himself as an example when I was a child, but when I became a man. Now, what, just look at our present life in this world. It is a fact that one can be relatively mature today compared to what he was, say, 20, 30 years ago. If I look at myself as a Christian when I started out at age 17, and I look at myself as a Christian now that I'm 68, 51 years later, then I can say that there's a huge difference. I've come a long way since those days. So that in comparison to where I was, you could say that I'm a mature Christian as opposed to a babe in Christ. I certainly ought to be if I'm going to be a pastor teaching other people the word of God. So it's indeed a fact that one can now be relatively mature or perfect in relation to what he was in the past. But it is a fact that the ultimate complete perfection of growth will never be experienced until our bodies are raised from the dead and we are completely and totally conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see this by looking at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Now, before I read that, I want to go back and fetch a thought that I overlooked that I think is important. When Paul says, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away, 
he's talking about the completion and of the text, the completion of the divine revelation. The word perfect in the Bible is used in two different ways. Sometimes it's referring to moral perfection, as when we read in Job chapter one that Job was a perfect man and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. There is perfection that refers to moral uprightness, moral perfection, perfection in righteousness, perfection in goodness, perfection of one's character. And then there is perfection that refers to, for lack of a better term, proportional perfection. Uh, like, for example, I'll give, I'll give you a verse that'll bring this into focus for you. Over in the book of Leviticus 22, verse 21, we read, whosoever offereth the sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow, or a free will offering in beeves, beeves being plural for beef, <laughs> beeves or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. And then he goes on in the verses that follow and describes how to be perfect, it must have no parts lacking. There must be nothing superfluous, nothing extra, uh, nothing lacking. Every body part in place. In other words, complete, proportionally perfect, perfect with no parts lacking. So when Paul is talking about this perfect body of information, he's not meaning to tell us that he's talking about, let me come at it this way. He's talking about proportional perfection. That is, once the body of information is complete, there will be nothing to be added to it. There will be nothing lacking from it. It will be proportionately complete. Now, when you talk about moral perfection as it pertains to the scripture, every single piece and part of the Bible, every prophecy that ever fell from the mouth of God, I don't care if it's one sentence, I don't care if it's one word, is morally perfect. Perfect. God's statutes are righteous altogether. So when Paul is talking about the perfection of this body of prophecy, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 13, he's not talking about it becoming morally perfect, for every prophecy from God was always morally perfect. He's talking about it being proportionally perfect. It will be a complete body of information with no part lacking. We will have all the truth God wants us to have while we live in this world. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13. And the point that I'm after here is that we will never be completely um, morally perfect, we will ne never be completely perfect in our persons until our bodies are redeemed, we're glorified, and conform fully to the image of Christ. And Paul makes this plain in this passage in Philippians chapter 3, verses 11 through 14. Paul says, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. See, notice, Paul doesn't consider himself already perfect. Even though Paul was the most mature Christian you could ever want to meet anywhere when it comes to personal growth and maturity in this world, yet even as mature as our pattern, the Apostle Paul was, yet in relation to what he will be in the resurrection at the second coming, he would say, I'm not yet perfect. I still got a way to go. So I'm constantly reaching forward toward that goal, constantly striving to be more and more like the Lord Jesus, even though I will never attain that fully until he comes and I'm raised in his likeness. So when it comes to personal perfection, well, we've got a long way to go. Now, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, so Paul is talking here in verse 11 about the perfection of his person and, and, so he, and, and his growth uh, with the understanding that the fullness of our growth will never be achieved until the second coming of Christ. So then he goes on and says, for now, and notice that verse 12 starts with the word for, 
connecting it back to first 11, which is dealing with the subject of personal growth. Here we're not talking about the growth of information. We're talking about the growth of the person. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now in this verse, seeing through a glass darkly contrasts with seeing face to face. Knowing in part contrasts with knowing as we are known. Now let's find out when this face to face thing is gonna take place and this will start to shed some light on what Paul is telling us. When are we gonna have the face to face where we will know our Lord as we are known? When is that going to happen? That's the second coming, when we see our Lord. Uh, for example, we go over to the book of Job, chapter 19. Job, chapter 19, and verse uh, 25. Job says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. There's his second coming. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold and not another. There's the face to face. God will be seeing me and I'll see him, though my reins be consumed within me. And then let's go over to Isaiah 33 and verse 17. Isaiah 33 and verse 17. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty, and they shall behold the land that is very far off. Then in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Behold, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's the face to face. We will see him as he is. And then lastly, in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22 and verse 4, and they shall see his face. So there's the face to face. When we see him by and by at the second coming in glory, then that expression that I shall know even as I am known, that expression as I am known refers to God's knowledge of us. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 9. But now, Galatians 4, 9. But out now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, I shall know as I am known, as God knows me now. And then at First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, First Timothy, oh, pardon me, I'm sorry, Second Timothy chapter 2, Second Timothy 2, 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, the Lord knoweth them that are his. You see, right now, as I'm speaking right now, God knows all of us face to face. God is looking at me right now, square in the face. He sees me, but I don't see him. But there is coming a day when I will know as I'm known. Just as he knows me right now, face to face, I will know him face to face. As he sees me, and knows me, so shall I see him and know him. And oh man, am I looking forward to that. Uh, can I get an amen from anybody on that one? <laughs> Linda just said amen, thanks. Amen. You, you guys still out there? Okay, fine, all right. Okay, let's go back now. So, um, <clears throat> so going back to this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what Paul is letting us know is that even with the revelation of God that we have now, and even though we have it in its fullness, in its completeness, even with that, we still are seeing through a glass darkly. We still don't see face to face. And even with a full, complete revelation, our knowledge of it is only partial. You see, we're growing in grace. We're growing in knowledge. So we still don't know it all yet. We're still learning, still learning. And so we do indeed see and know, that's not the point. 
but our sight and knowledge lack the clarity and fullness that they will have in the future. No matter how much of God we know in his word now, if we could see what it is to know him face to face as we are known, we would realize how dim, how dull, how dark our present vision actually is. I mean, compared to the Old Testament, I mean, we see and know so much more and understand so much more than they did. Even the people that wrote the Old Testament, we understand more of what it was teaching than they do. So compared to the Old Testament, we have much more light, much more clarity and insight than they had. But compared to what we're going to have by and by, we're still just seeing through a glass darkly. And we still just know in part, even with the full body of information in front of us, let me tell you, people, I'm 68 years old. I've been studying this book since I was a 15-year-old teenager, and I feel like I'm just skimming the surface. There are parts of this book that I do not understand. I remember John Yarsinski one time was reading the, the last chapters of Ezekiel describing the temple vision, and I got a phone call wanting me to explain it, and I said, John, too bad. <laughs> it's a mystery to me. My daughter, Brittany, one time was reading the prophecy of Zechariah, and I heard from her bedroom, Dad? And she called me in to explain it. I said, honey, I've got the same problem you do. There's stuff in there that I just don't know what he's talking about. There's plenty in here like that. And so, you know, compared to what we're going to know, well, uh, it's just we're seeing through a glass darkly knowing in part. So anyway, <clears throat> What he's showing us here in verses 11 through 12 is the perfection of our persons between what we are now as we're growing till we come to the perfection of face to face. So again, to sum it up, verses eight through 10 is talking about the perfection of the body of information. Verses 11 and 12 is talking about the perfection of our persons when we finally see him face to face. Now we come to verse 13, and this is the clincher. Stay with me now. You got to follow this. It's very important. And it'll clinch the argument that shows that the gifts of prophecy and knowledge, this, these gifts of partial revelation until the revelation was complete, have ceased. Now remember, and so he says, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, remember what I told you already, that at the time Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 4, you had four things in operation at that time, the gift of knowledge, the gift of prophecy, faith, and hope. We have seen that faith and hope are going to terminate at the second coming when we see him by and by. I've already submitted the proof for that. But you're also told very plainly in verse 8 that the gift of prophecy and the gift of knowledge are going to fail and they are going to vanish away. They are going to be done away when that which is perfect has come. Now, most charismatics believe that the gifts of prophecy and tongues and knowledge are going to continue until the second coming. So the charismatics have those gifts terminating at the same time that faith and hope terminate. Well, that's not going to work if you look at the verbs. Notice prophecy shall fail. Knowledge shall vanish away. Uh, when these things are, when, when that which is perfect has come, then these partial gifts shall be done away. Now those verbs, vanish away, cease, fail, stand in marked contrast to the verb abide. The verb abide means to wait, stay, or remain. Notice how the word abide contrasts with the words shall fail, shall cease, shall vanish away. The idea that Paul is conveying very powerfully in this passage is that when prophecy and tongues and knowledge are done away, faith and hope and charity will still be around. Those things will vanish away those things will be done away, but we will still have faith in operation, and we will still have hope in operation. <laughs> Do you see that? <laughs> wow, I can make it more plain. Thanks, Jim, for nodding your head yes. Now, let me show you this same kind of a verb contrast in another passage. 
and, and it'll help hopefully to bring this into focus. Let me show you the same kind of contrasting verbs in another passage. Come over to Hebrews chapter 1, 10 through 12. Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. And thou, Lord, he's quoting from Psalm 102. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the works of thine hands. Watch it. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Remain is a synonym of abide. It means the same thing. You see, you've got something perishing and something sticking around. They, the heavens and earth, shall perish, but thou remainest. God will still be around when the heavens and the earth are gone. And they shall all wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Heaven and earth will fail, but in contrast, God won't fail. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but in contrast, God will abide. God will stay around. God will remain. And so when the earth and the heavens are done away, God will still be around. So the fact that prophecies and knowledge shall be done away, whereas faith and hope abide, clearly proves that they do not all continue to the second coming. They do not all have the same point of termination. Prophecies and knowledge end before faith and hope end. Faith and hope end at the second coming. They're going to abide. They're going to stick around. They're going to remain until the second coming. Whereas the prophecies and the knowledge and the tongues will have ceased before that. And that's why you have those verbs of contrast referring to those gifts shall vanish away, shall cease, shall fail. And in contrast to that, faith and hope abide remain, stay all the way until we see him face to face. We need no longer need the faith principle in order to believe what we do see and expect what we do not see. Therefore, I hope you followed that. In conclusion, with the completion of the New Testament, we have in the 66 books of our Bible a perfect, and complete body of information whereby we may understand the will of God, find direction for our lives, and gain assurance of eternal and gain assurance of eternal salvation until at last we see him face to face. Or to put it in the words of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star, star arise in our hearts. Now, let me say one other thing about growing in knowledge. As we are in our present condition, we're in the process of gaining more and more knowledge of our Lord and of his will as it is revealed in his written word. We have it all there and we gain more and more knowledge. Now, as our knowledge increases, a lot of times what happens as our knowledge increases, it has a correcting, purifying, cleansing effect in our life. It happens all the time. You go to church, you learn some pr practical principle, and you thought, oh boy, I wish I'd known that. I, 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 I made a mistake back there. Uh, now that I know better, I'm not going to do that anymore. In other words, our growth in knowledge has a purifying, correcting effect upon us. Now, once we get to heaven, we are going to be absolutely morally perfect. We will be as perfect as humanity can be. We will be as perfect as the glorified Lord Jesus. There will be no more perfecting of our character, no more becoming more right and more perfect in our persons. But that's not to say we won't continue to learn in heaven. I'm sure we will. I think throughout all eternity, we will be exploring and discovering more and more of the wonder and riches and works of God. But this will not be a learning process that will correct us. No, no, because there'll be nothing about us that needs correcting. This will just be a learning process that just delights us and fascinates us as we learn more. Because let's face it, everything we learn in the Bible doesn't correct us. A lot of it just thrills us and fascinates us. So that kind of learning we can expect for all eternity. Thank God for the day 
when all of our learning will just be thrill and fascination, no more shame of face, no more having to repent, because we've now found out how stupid we were and how we needed to fix this and fix that. <laughs> that kind of learning will forever cease when we see him by and by and we are as he is in the perfection of our person. But between now and then, now abideth faith, hope, charity, and the greatest of these is that eternally never-ending unfailing principle, which is charity. Thank God for his love for us. Thank God for the love we have for one another, a love we enjoy now and can look forward to experiencing for all eternity.